So one of the questions that came up in the chat just now was, couldn't we improve the Markov model by including, for example, the number of passes that had happened up to that point, up to this point? And that's exactly correct. And in a way, that's what we do in the next stage here. So the, the final stage of this is to look at possession chain models, how uh, sequences of passes fit together and how we can use them to evaluate the quality of actions. And I think what I'm going to come to here is that possession chains are really there. They are a, a kind of fundamental unit of football. More than thinking about just spatial coordinates as we do in the Markov model, if we look at things from the chain of events that occur, the passes around the back line maybe, and then a, a, a very fast attack or a counterattack, these really define the way that coaches speak about football, about how fans speak about football. And we would like our analysis to reflect that. And that's why this concept of possession chains is so important when we try to analyze and, and evaluate actions. It actually reflects how most people think of football in short sequences of possessions. And if you go into the next lectures that are coming up, we have um, Lot and Jan, who have a sequence, a very nice uh, possession chain, a very nice sequence of videos on the, um, their, their system, which is called the VAPE model, which is a value action model. And they start very much from this idea of a possession chain. In their case, they look at the 10 actions that lead up to a shot. And in the, I, like, I like this example because the shot is eventually by De Bruyne. This is a match Belgium against Brazil. The shot is eventually by De Bruyne here at the end. But it, leading up to that shot, it starts with Neymar uh, recovering the ball, shooting, having a shot blocked, a corner being played. Then Fellaini plays the ball up to Lukaku, who runs here, plays the ball to De Bruyne, who takes a few more steps and then takes a shot. Um, and we have a sequence of actions. And this is what I mean by a possession chain. And in, in their case, they decide to use all, all their possession chains have length 10. They look at the 10 last actions leading up to a shot. And they look at how those actions contribute to um, a shot being generated. And, and even here, even when you think back to Neymar, Neymar's blocked shot and the failed corner both contributed to a chance for De Bruyne at the end. And you, you have to actually watch Lotten and, and Jan's videos in order to get all the information, about, well, to understand how they fit the model. But they start with this idea that football is a, a chain of possession and they're going to evaluate those possessions. And the way that they do this is that they use a probabilistic classifier. And you could write logistic regression, and it's actually the logistic regression that they use. Or you could have a neural network, or you could have some sort of classifier here in order to do this. And their key idea is that they predict whether a game state will yield a goal. So for a group of three actions in a row with inside the possession chain, so this might be, for example, um, Lukaku receiving the ball, him running to this point, his pass here, and De Bruyne receiving the ball. Those would be the three actions in a row. For those three actions, they look, well, does that, re does that result in a goal at the end of those actions? And they put a label here, one, if it results in a goal, and zero, if it doesn't result in a goal. So these three actions were inside a group of 10 actions, which within those 10 actions, led to a goal for the team. They also have some context variables here which describe the game state and so on. And once you have all of these groups of three actions within the chain of 10 actions, you stick all of that into your probabilistic classifier and you develop a model which should be able to predict the probability that's a goal given the types of actions that you've seen up to that point. And this is what's illustrated over here. This would be the training phrase and then there's a test phase where given a new action or a new set of three actions within a possession chain of 10 and the context of the thing, what's the probability that a, a goal is scored? And that's the prediction. And I, I mentioned here, I think that they do use logistic regression primarily, primarily for fitting their models, 
because you have you have quite a lot of variables going into this model there are, i don't know 20 or so here but essentially in the end you're trying to predict a one or zero label whether those actions 10 by by 10 actions later predicted a goal would occur i'm not going to go into too many more details of what they do because there's very uh, extensive videos with lovely um, coded examples of how this entire system works but i do want to take a step back to start with and then a step forward in this and and um, oh yeah before that i wanted to say what I like about this approach and all of the things I'm going to talk about with the possession chains is it, it builds around what's important in football. I mentioned this before, but I'll just say it again. Possession, having the ball and what you do with the ball is really a key part of playing football and it's how coaches understand it. And so when you build up an approach like this, it's quite abstract when you have it in a probabilistic classifier. But it says, you know, these are stuff you do. These are passes of the ball. Um, these are ball recoveries. And how do they lead to goals? And so it really does build up about what's important in football. In a way, I think the Markov model in the previous section doesn't quite do because having the ball on the pitch at certain places is quite important, but it's not natural really to describe football as a memoryless process about where you manage to move the ball to, the, where the ball is flowing towards, is much more natural to describe it in terms of these possession chains, where sometimes things happen slow, 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 and then they go fast in one direction, or there's a counterattack where everything happens fast. Possession chains are a more natural description of what actually happens in football. One very simple way you can, and, and uh, yeah, and I use possession chains a lot in the sorts of work um, we do. This is one from a, um, some TV work we're, we're doing recently. Here you can, we're using stats bomb data, you have pressure on various passes. Uh, carry, this is like, this is leading up to the shot here. So um, this is a miss by the goalkeeper, but you actually have 19 or 22 actions building up towards the shot. And you can use all of these to classify and understand what that specific uh, possession was all about. In this case, it was regaining here, very rapid um, counter-attack and coming up um, and producing a shot and a goal. You see this also opt to do this um, now and again, or um, um, you see the, I think the BBC website uses this quite a lot, looking at where teams have recovered the ball, where they play the ball, and all of the actions that lead up to goals. Certainly when you see one of these goals that has a very long build-up, it's interesting to see how the chain moves around the, around the pitch before rapidly moving forward, for example. Um, so it's a very standard way. It's become a very, well, maybe not that standard, but a very common way you actually see different goals visualized in terms of the possession chain that led up to them. And StatsBomb developed a very nice um, way of measuring this called XG chain or, or not measuring, measuring the chain itself. Given that you have a chain, how can you attribute um, points or how can you attribute value to the player's actions who are working within that chain? And what they do is the following, they find all the possessions each player is involved in, they find all the shots within those possessions, then they sum up their expected goals for each of those shots. There's various ways of doing it. You might actually look at the highest expected goals in the possession, or um, you, you treat the shots as dependent events, whatever you, whatever you want, there's various ways of doing that. And then you assign that sum to each player, however involved they were. So this allows you to extrapolate right back to the start of a possession, how each player contributed. So it might well be there's a defender who maybe touches the ball three or four times in a build-up, which then 30 seconds later ends up being in a shot. And in this system, their contribution is considered just as important as the striker who, who scored the goal. And that makes it a very a much fairer way in some way of how you've actually contributed to the goal. Interestingly, in many ways, this goes back to the plus minus model. It's like a plus minus model where you have expected goals included in it. So, but only for the players who touch the ball during that um, expected goal. So, but it's, it's quite similar to the plus minus model. 
And one way you always should use to test if these types of things are working is you expect Lionel Messi to be good on a measure like this, number of touches in the, in the build up to a goal. And it turns out that Lionel Messi is good on this measure. This is Barcelona 2016, 2017. He's top of the team in contributing. And goalkeeper's bottom of the team in contributing. And this gives, it, I suppose it still favours forwards to some degree, but it does start to distribute the, um, the, the value in the build-up um, in some way. And you can go in, there's a nice web page where you can go in and read all about um, XG chain and XG build up. Now, the limitation, of course, of that is it, and, and this has been similar to some of the earlier things we've seen, the limitation is that it doesn't look at the difficulty of what you've done when you've been involved in this build up. So a defender might simply have passed the ball to another defender who then did a very impressive pass up to the left winger, for example, who cut inside and did a dribble. But that first defender I mentioned, he will get points for the final goal, even though his contribution was relatively minor. It was just a pass to another person who ended up being the playmaker. So we also want to have a way of assessing the, how difficult a contribution is and how valuable a contribution is. And this is a way that, um, well, I've developed and, and we've used in various different applications. And it is very similar to the value added approach, but instead of the 10, looking at the 10 actions, what I do is I just look at every possession chain during the build up to a shot on goal. So what I've illustrated here is three different, um, I've, I've illustrated three different possession chains, A, B, and C. A goes in here, there's a pass um, into the box, but then there's another pass, but then eventually the ball just goes out of the side. Uh, maybe it's defended and it leaves the pitch. B ends up in a goal, that's why I've labeled it in black. So there's a pass here, very direct pass, and, and this is going to be important. This is a quite similar pass to the one that occurred in A. Then there's a dribble, and then there's a shot, and I'll say that this one was a goal. And C is a pass from here, pass from there. Again, this similar pass, then the ball just ends up going out on the sideline over there. So two possession chains that end in, a, um, end in nothing, uh, maybe a corner or a, a throw in, and one possession chain that ends up in a goal. Now, what we can do, and we always want to turn these things into nice regression problems. What I've done here is I've taken, taken this figure here and I've, I've transplanted it into a table. So chain A had two passes here, actually has a, a third pass here, but just say we have this one pass here, one pass here, and then it doesn't end up in a shot and it doesn't end up uh, with any expected goals. So 50, 70 to 54, 56, that's us first pass. 55, 50 to 80, 61, that's the second pass. I haven't included the third pass, but basically after that, it ends up going out of play. Then possession change B, well, this is the more interesting one because this ends up with a pass in this direction, then a pass here, and then it ends up in a shot. And what I do is I label, well, one here for a shot. And then I also put, let's say the expected goals on this shot was 0 0.2. I put an expected goal label on the 0 0.2. Um, then finally, we have possession chain C. It consists of three passes, one, two, three. Then the ball goes out. So it doesn't result in a shot and it doesn't result in any expected goals. So in order to, and I said is, the point here is that they all go through the same, all three, there's, there's one pass here or yeah, this pass is very similar to this pass, is very similar to that pass. And what we want to do really is evaluate how a pass from here to here is likely to generate a goal. And we do this by logistic regression. We look if a play ends with a shot. Actually, this should be, it shouldn't be goal there. This should be shot. Let me, let me change that. So if, the, um, if it finishes with a shot, or if it finishes without a shot, and then we can do a logistic regression. So the probability of a shot given the start and end coordinates of the pass, 
You can actually put in other uh, qualifiers into this equation as well, but that's the basic, um, the basic structure of the thing. And you do a regression just on, just on it, whether it's going to end up in a shot. And that's the first stage of, um, of the fit. And the second thing is to do a regression to find out, well, how valuable was that shot? And what I do there is I do a second linear regression this time, which is the probability of a goal given, um, given a shot. And that's actually the expected goal. So for every chain, I have the expected goals at the end of it. I can do a linear regression to predict the expected goals given the x and y coordinates of the um, of the pass and that allows us to evaluate so this pass might for example one out of ten times it might end up being a goal and so it will get a value something like one out of ten in this particular system because it, it ends up being the goal with that frequency and it's a very good way of as i said the, the starting problem here was that not all passes are equal and passes which tend to end in shots, that tend to end in goals, will be given a higher value than passes that, um, that don't do that. What we can produce with this is heat maps which give you a value of particular passes. So this is an example where you have the ball here. Where is the value of making certain passes? And white color means that there is lower um, value and the red color means that there is, whoops, sorry. Red color means there's higher value. So a pass, of course, straight in front of the goalkeeper, of course, as, as long as the goalkeeper isn't there. Uh, and this always assumes that it's just successful passes. Then you get um, a higher value for making that pass and a lower value for making a back pass. And you can include in this model, you can include other qualifiers, um, like if it was a cross, um, if it's with left and right foot, for example, good foot, bad foot, those types of qualifiers, you can put them in and use them to, to, um, to help fit your model. And we use this, um, there's a, a, a website there that we've created where we actually do this type of evaluation and you can apply it actually to all different actions. So you can apply it both to passes, which are shown here in green, but also you can apply it to defensive actions by sort of doing a reverse of the thing. So if you get the ball back here, then that's more valuable than getting the ball back in the middle of the pitch because you're much more likely to have stopped a dangerous chance. Um, and getting the ball back near to the opposition is also more valuable because you're likely to start a dangerous chance from that. And all of those can be established also through using um, some form of regression model. And I thought I'd um, just I think I'll just skip that particular one. Uh, whoa. And I will just end by going in and showing you how this works. Um, so this I took the last 10 matches played by Liverpool last season and I, I think I had this example right at the start of the course in lecture one when I was looking at passes and I won't go into the off the ball thing because it's, um, yeah, it's a little it doesn't work perfectly but the other things attack defense and shots um, yeah I think, I think we're going to look at this again with tracking but attack defense so what, what I'll do is I'll go into, uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll explain a little bit about how these, these three things, attack, defense, and shots, I'll leave the off the ball out of it just now, work. And so you can see here that Virgil van Dijk's got points for all of these things. He also gets some points if the fans choose him in the app. But um, I will concentrate on the attack, the defense, and the shots. The shots here is basically expected goals. And so, Mohamed Salah was the most successful in the last um, matches and you can see where all of his good chances were from. Um, what we do is we give expected goals points for every shot, though we have a little variation here that we give um, full points for actually scoring. So the probability, if you score, the probability of scoring is one. We give a thousand points for expected goals equal to one and so you get a thousand points for scoring. 
everything else is proportional to expected goals. So that would be a 9.4% chance, that's a 5.4% chance, that was a 3.75% chance, and so on. Something out here, um, we also give negative points if you miss from, from distance, but this is all relative to expected goals. And compare here, Manet has his chances on the other side, Firmino has a few less chances, less high quality chances, um, and so on. But I think I was mainly talking about passes, and I like this example very much because when we created this model, we've, we created about two years ago, we wanted to have it so that it had a good balance between different players and it could also capture things to do with style of style of play or different playing positions and capture things to do with style of play. And it turns out that Virgil van Dijk was the best player for Liverpool last season, not just in defence, but he was actually for, in attack. And you can see that in this particular map. So these passes come out as extremely valuable. Very long passes, often going to start, um, often uh, leading to possession high up in the field, often cutting through lines, um, is really what he was doing last season. And you can also see for Andrew Robertson, what he did provided was passes change in direction of play in one direction. And Trent Alexander-Arnold often finding Robertson actually with passes deep um, down into the, the bottom left-hand corner. So these players and not the central midfielders, often you might just expect the central midfielders to have the highest points, these players were doing a different style of passing than, for example, Manchester City, who were the better team the season before, but it still picks it out. And the Liverpool players still ended up being ranked highest in the league when compared to other players, despite the fact that they were playing a different style of football. And I think that's really important because, and is captured quite well by the possession chain approach as compared to just the plain Markov model approach. Markov model approach tends to just focus on and pick up quality in central football. If you have a possession chain approach, it also picks up the quality that you can get from long passes leading to counterattacks or penetrating and going through, going through the defense. Um, and we've been running these, um, we've been running these uh, rankings for some time now. And Virgil van Dijk was, no, he wasn't just the best Liverpool player, he was the best player last season. Uh, for the 12 rankings and often the rankings do correspond to the players that are talked about most um, both in the big teams and for the smaller teams they give uh, reliable there is never a ground truth of who's the best player but they give reliable indications of the, of the types of players that we, we think are good and Finally, last thing I want to do is maybe go back all the way around to um, back to uh, player radars. And if I share my screen here and just show you finally what you can also do. I've, I've said some skepticism about this type of visualization. But what you can also do once you have this type of approach is you can weight the actions with their quality. So previous, some of the player radars we looked at, they contain the number of actions adjusted for minutes during the match. What I've done here is I've actually weighted every action based on how, mu how much they contribute in terms of the model that we've talked about for passing. Um, so when we when we look at Virgil van Dijk's passing in an own third, passing in middle third, he's like, and passing in final third, we see that here he's passing middle third, he's second or third best in the league um, for his position as centre back. These are weighted by the quality that those those um, those passes achieve, and shooting is is weighed weighed by ex expected goals and so on. Hockey assists here we use for second assists. Um, and so we can actually get, uh, we can both find the number of actions that he's completed, plus we can weight the quality of those actions. And that's it, I've, I've put up this final, final message here. In some ways, um, this is as far as we can get using um, event data. 
We've been through a lot of stages here. We've used it for lots of different visualizations if we take up the course as, as a whole. And then where we've ended up here is evaluating possession chains, which are the sort of fundamental unit of football. They're the, I've talked a lot about this idea of memorylessness and forgetting things. Within a possession chain, I think pretty much there you can talk about a, a temporal unit of football. A possession chain, which is between five and 30 seconds is as a unit contains some sort of memory and should be the thing that you've analyzed. And I've written here that we only use linear Poisson and logistic regression in doing this. And I think that's important in the message that I quite a lot like to emphasize that we should keep the tools that we use to analyze these problems relatively simple. Before we start throwing a load of neural networks at these problems, we should use the statistical tools that we know uh, can work and are reliable. And in, the fa in fact, in the end, even if you come to something quite complicated like the, the, the VATE model and the model I've just mentioned now for that we use at 12, then we use logistic regression to do the fitting because it's robust and reliable and we, we know how it's worked and know how it works. And the same when we were looking at even the most advanced plus minus models, we use linear regression albeit with this extra term to punish two complicated models. So these tools are the sort of bedrock of um, doing this type of, of advanced analytics. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you.